How are you? I'm good. Good. Yeah. Ready for very difficult questions. <laughs> well, no. Well, well, I've got a few, um, and I'm sure that our delegates, um, our, our guests joining us this afternoon, will have a few. If you do have a question for Mike, please do put it into the chat function. Uh, and when I've got through my 86 questions for Mike, I will, um, I will invite you uh, to um, maybe come and have a chat with Mike and put your question direct. But it's up to you. You put your question in the chat and let me know whether you'd like to come on screen or not. And, uh, and we'll take it from there. So, Mike, I've given some background to you and Alison. Perhaps you can give us some insight into your background and how Alison came to be and some of your key learnings. And I'm sure Chuck Feeney was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, okay, well, th thanks for having me on and uh, appreciate it. I guess a, a bit more of background is in the sense that uh, I guess I always like socially driven technology and, and this, since the first days that I realized that the, the internet was what, what it was going to become or when I realized that around 1991, 1992, which is I was in the internet fairly early, uh, I just realized that, uh, particularly with education, uh, not only what an interesting business it could be, but what what an amazing social impact you could have. And I think that's a lot of uh, a lot of people are looking for that in in their work, is that that they can have a social impact as well as a, as a financial impact. And uh, and and it's the way that I've formed my career, I guess, is that I focused it around socially stuff. I I often say it didn't, doesn't mean that I took a vow of poverty, uh, but at the same time I'd be pretty frugal as my wife would be. And um, you know it's important to give in society. And I think from early readings of, of of life and whatever you, the more you can give, the more you the more you give, the more you get. And uh, so I, through whatever work that I would do, I, I like that. And I, and I guess that manifests itself in Alison in the sense that I felt I felt early on and before even Alison is that if you if if one person could try and make the world a little bit better, what would you focus on? And, and education is clearly it, in my uh, view, um, because it, um, education underpins all social progress. And whether you look at problems of poverty or climate change or political instability, an awful lot of it goes back to education. A lot of politicians couldn't get away with, the, with what they get away with if, uh, if people were properly educated, whether it's media literacy or just basic economics. So I guess fundamentally, um, I, I, I love the fact that technology are phenomenal tools that our generation now have to try and change the world better and uh, and, and just Alison is part of that so part of uh, a bit of background in philosophy I guess. And, and I mean you didn't need a, a lockdown or a, a radical change that we've seen in the world over the last three or four months to uh, to make you um, appreciate um, the, the um, not the sense necessarily that the, the necessity to, to be a responsible business do you feel that over the last three or four months that a lot of businesses have come to that realization that they need to have a social conscience more? I think it's good business. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, young people are far more interested in, in finding meaning in their work. Um, in, in, in the UK, you have Sir Ronald Cohn. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, he was taught, he's been, he wrote a book recently, which I had the pleasure of reading. And he talked about instead of young technologists trying to create unicorns in terms of uh, startups with a billion dollar valuation, what about companies that can have a, uh, that can impact people and can impact a billion people and to have an impact unicorn? And I, and I like that idea and I subscribe to it. This is the type of ambition that we need. This is the type of young entrepreneurs that we need, male and female of every color and race. It's just we need to do. We need to change the world for the better. Uh, you know, I, I personally think that the world is on a collision course with climate in a very big way. How do, how, how do we actually change course? And the only way we can do it is through education, developing technologies from that education that actually allow us to deal with it. So uh, I, I, I think that so, uh, having a social awareness in business is, is essential. The brightest people will not work for businesses that, uh, have, that where there's relatively little meaning in, their, in, in, in what they do or what they're asking people to do every day. And we saw how some businesses conducted themselves during lockdown. Do you, do you feel that you know, some of the things that, you know, I won't name any names necessarily, but we know who, who they are, but you know, what, how they conducted themselves during lockdown will have a long lasting impact on their future business? Yeah, well, I, I think in fairness, it's a very unusual situation. And a few people were caught offside and probably did the wrong things in the first few weeks or month. 
um, in terms of trying to, for instance, allowing the government to pay for staff when actually they should be paying for staff themselves mm -hmm. and, and things like that, a uh, number of football clubs to be named among that. But, you know, Don't get me started on football clubs, Mike, please. <laughs> uh, a lot of people came back on side. Uh, you know, I don't think there's been an awful lot of profiteering. I do think what's been hidden is actually that there's a lot of businesses doing really well in these circumstances. And I'd have to put my hand up and say Alison is one of those. But there are others. You know, I just look at, uh, you know, restaurants, for instance. My, my, my son's home from college and he's delivering for a Chinese business. They have never been busier. <laughs> And uh, so, yes, there's a lot of unemployment, but, you know, you need to look at there is other opportunities as well. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that's that's what businesses have to look for. And for people who are looking at upskilling, you can very much transfer one, one skill set from one industry into another. And uh, online courses can really help that give you both the confidence that you can do it and also give um, messaging uh, to, to an employer that you're able to do it. Yeah, I mean, I was going to come on to, I mean, we obviously heard about a lot more redundancies today and, and, and that's been a, a constant theme running through lockdown. But um, you know, look, looking at Alison and, and the business environment, we've got a lot of businesses with us today from a wide range of sectors. How can they use um, free education within a business environment to help evolve their businesses? Yeah, well, well, I think things are changing in the sense that few companies now will actually hire somebody who are generalists and middle of the road saying, oh, I'll put up my hand and oh, I'll help you out. People want more expertise and more professionalism than that. And it goes all the way down from high tech businesses to ordinary businesses. So I'll give you an example, just even in, in, in small businesses, if you were a, a bakery and you had five people that were you know, serving at the counter, because of free learning, why wouldn't you tell them to go actually go off and do a, a, a course in customer service? Why, if they're working in your business, isn't it a good idea that they have a basic sense of what accounting is? Isn't it a good idea that they have a basic sense of HR? Isn't it a good, a good idea that they have a basic sense of project management or operations management? And we don't think of these things as saying, well, hold on, I'm only a small business. But no, the fact is you're a small business, but you need to be efficient because other businesses that are also equally small are taking advantage of free, free online learning. And free online learning has some magical qualities that old learning did not have in the sense that it, it doesn't cost. You can go on and, and learn an awful lot of things for free. You can do it flexibly. You can do it in your own time. You don't have to be doing it when you're in the office. You don't have to be taking a day off. You don't have to be driving down the road to the, the local technical college to do a course that you remember very little from. So, you know, it, it is important for small business to say, hold on, what is this revolution in online learning bringing us? It was bringing us the capability of training all of your staff to a much higher level of productivity. And it's both an opportunity to make a better business and to create more security for yourself and your employees. But also there's the downside. If you don't do it, the chances are that your business is not going to be as efficient as another. And long term, it will affect your competitiveness. So free online learning is both a boom for, for a smaller business, but it's also something to watch as well. And I think that internationally, it's a big lesson that uh, us living in Ireland and the UK and the United States, we've been used to almost being, uh, our, our, our competitiveness has been protected in a way because we're distant. But now so much of the economy is going online that when the local company down the road is actually hiring somebody, it will hire somebody in South Africa or will hire somebody in India that's much cheaper to hire. So then the person in the UK is just saying to themselves, well, hey, hold on, how do I become more valuable so that that person in the UK that has a job actually turns to me and doesn't turn abroad. It all goes down to what can you do for me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds savage, but that's what business is about. It's mm -hmm. just what can you do? Are, if I hire you as an employee, are you going to be as competitive as the next guy? Or do you know more? And hence, that's all, the, again, the reason why even if we're unemployed or whether in it we're in employment, we must continuous learn, continuously learn. We must continuously upskill because that is the workplace of today and tomorrow. And the idea that we can go to college and do a course 23 years, 20 years ago and then walk in and expect that somehow it gives us credit in the marketplace, that day is gone. I mean, you referenced um, unemployed and, and also that you know, Alison.com is one of those businesses that has done very well um, in the past three or four months. Have you noticed any, I mean, I don't know if you know, sort of the background of, of those that are, that are joining your courses but um yeah. you know you, you do so so you have seen i should imagine quite a lot of unemployed upskilling as you yeah. say 
Yeah. So, you know, I was talking to a gentleman in the UK, uh, just outside London the other day, and he was in aviation. And he, and he rightly thinks, or at least I would agree with him, that aviation has a very dim future for the next couple of years. But he, but he was project managing, but he'd never done a project management course. But then what he did was he applied to work for the, uh, for the health service, and which was expanding and had a job for project managers who was, who was managing the, the extra intake of social workers. And he got a job doing that. And if you had asked him a year ago, when he was in aviation, that he would ever work in the health sector, uh, he would have said, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. What was the connection? The connection was actually he had a skill at project management, but he didn't have the confidence at it. So he went off and he did a diploma in project management on Allison, was able to um, show his employer that he had done that course and then had gone on. So again, you know, just because we're in a tough spot and we might be made unemployed, unemployed think of the skills that we really have. And if they're not certified, just in the sense of, you know, having a hard code piece of paper to say that we have these skills, go do a course online, pass that course, go be interviewed. And, and, and if you mention these skills, let the employer ask you about them. Because the wonderful thing about Alison is that if you turn around to me in an interview situation and you say, that, oh, I've done a diploma in project management, I can literally turn around a laptop to you and tell you to do the assessment for diploma in project management and immediately there see whether you get 80% of the questions <laughs> right, which is the pass rate. So I think that what this is showing is the immediacy of, uh, you know, people are, 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 are valuable in an employment situation for what they know now and what they can do today, all right? Uh, what we've moved away from is people with qualifications that are carrying them for 20 to 30 years uh, and believing that it means something when actually the, the workforce has got way more competitive than that. So this is, again, the immediacy. And, and of course, that leads into the whole area of psychometrics. Uh, of you know how do we evaluate the uh, capability of somebody today and years ago it was oh well have you a degree in this or that but everyone has a degree today so how do you compare people and uh, would you believe uh, um, and this is a statistic most people don't realize you know only seven percent of the world have ever been to college right 93 percent of the world have not been to college and yet some of the larger companies in recent years have been saying that they have a skills shortage well of course they do, because they're only looking for a very small population. But how do we go to all of these smart people that we know are there all across the world and assess just who are the people that we want to employ? Well, we can't put them to four-year degrees in colleges. It takes too long. It's too expensive. Mm -hmm. The traditional ways just don't work, in, don't work as well as they do. But we can give them a test. We can see how quickly they learn. We can see what they know now. And we can build upon that within a workplace. And that's why uh, skills are becoming a lot more practical. What can you do for me today? Uh, instead of this ephemeral idea that, oh, you went to college. Because what college re really is, tells us is, you know, maybe you had the discipline to do this uh, degree 20 years ago, and maybe according to the college that you went to, your parents were ex-wealthy, <laughs> or, or you were from a particular part of the country, which yeah. is all, all of this is meaningless in terms of what can you do for an employer uh, when you start. And, and you know, employers don't, don't want to keep making costly mistakes to then employing the wrong people and uh, is an expensive game. So it um, makes a lot of sense. I mean, you're, I mean you, you touched on the psychometric testing there. I mean, the, your workplace personality assessment, um, as you say, it's giving your employer, well, employers using uh, that particular tool valuable insights about themselves mm. uh, and potential hires. So how, how does it differ from the traditional psychometric testing tools that many of us um, here today would have encountered, such as disk profiling, et cetera? Yeah, well, the single biggest thing is that it's free. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember back when you've done it, is, is that they've traditionally been very expensive. And in some ways, it's, it's unfair because the people who have the money get the, get the, the knowledge and the self-knowledge that psychometric t tests can give you. So we, we launched personality tests, which is a workplace personality assessment. So saying, you know, before, before, we tell people before they even start studying, saying, hold on a minute, who are you? And do you know who you are? And do you know what your innate skills are? In, in terms of your personality, what job would you be best doing? And what courses would you be best studying? So these are important questions. And sometimes that's not added into the mix. People are saying, oh, do that course. But they don't know why. But, the, but an employer, what they can turn around actually on Alison, and uh, we have a pilot project actually working in the UK at the moment on, on this, is that we allow people to do groups. So for instance, you can get all your staff, 20, 50 people, and, and actually send them an email, and obviously all permission-based, they need to agree to do this. 
but we can give you the a, a psychometric profile of everyone in your in in, uh, in your employment. And in terms of then you can see whether the guy that you have working as your meet and greeter at the door, whether he's actually made to do that, or you know, is this someone who has a very analytical mind, or do they like doing that stuff? And that's just on the personality stuff. And in recent, uh, in, in, in weeks ahead, we're going to be launching cognitive skills. And again, it'll be entirely free. So if you want to assess an employee, you know, where's their verbal reasoning? Where's their numeracy reasoning? Are these people going to be dealing with money? Are they going to be dealing with calculations? And, uh, and then there's the whole idea of abstract reasoning. You know, says, can they put patterns together? They can, that often indicates how creative they are. These tests available for free, you can do a profile on everyone in your, uh, in, in your company. And of course, that goes back to the same with courses. What we can offer uh, companies is not to offer them the courses, but offer them the assessments. If you have uh, 15, 20 people in your business and you just wanted to know, well, what, what sort of skill set do I have? You know, where is IT literacy in my business? Where is English? You know, maybe I have some people that weren't born in the UK, or maybe I have some yeah, people from the UK that speaks a different breed of English than I do. <laughs> I don't know. It's just an understanding language. Can, can you assess you know, uh, where they are in basic things? Most employees, most employers don't actually know, who, really know who they employ in terms of their skill level. But again, industry is becoming far too competitive not to know that because businesses in the future will have not only a sense of what people have studied in the past, but they, they will have a very good sense of what people know now. And that will give them a real edge. I'm sure a lot of businesses in lockdown also found out a lot more about their staff than, than they ever knew. Um, we, we certainly worked a lot more closely as a team than we did beforehand, um, even though we're all, all working remotely. So I'm sure that, that goes for a lot of employers across the board, getting to know more about the skills of their staff. Oh, yeah. Well, I can, I can tell the Alison story on that. It's like we have about 100 staff worldwide and we had 23 in Galway. And I turned around to them and said, look, how many wants to be back in the office? And 17 said that they, they didn't. So we've downscaled. We've, it'll be interesting an impact on real estate everywhere oh, is that huge. companies like us are working entirely virtual now. And we're working with 35 nationalities in our company all over the world. So, you know, we, we're not stuck. To, it's very different. And, and for Alison, we found there was a huge... Uh, productivity gain of people mm. working. They weren't communi commuting. They were fresh yeah. when they started work at 8 a.m. in the morning. They, they didn't have the frustration of traffic. <laughs> um, they, f they could be flexible. They could turn off and go off and do what they wanted to do and still come back and get their job done. So I, I absolutely think uh, for certainly information businesses like us and more and more information, uh, more and more businesses have a, a, a deal of technology about them uh, is that our, our information communications at the very least working web-based that they'll find they're more productive in this way. And of course, if we could take a whole load of people off the roads of, of Britain and Ireland, wouldn't it be great? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's already made you... Made, I mean, you, you referenced climate before, and uh, climate experts will tell you that it's not maybe had the, um, the dent that uh, we, we'd all think it might have had, but um, it's, at least it's going some way down the road to, to helping with, with less pollution, etc. cetera. So uh, um, you've, you've answered my last question already, Mike, but I'm going to ask you, ask you anyway. Uh, we have got um, a couple of questions. If anybody does have any further questions for Mike, please do put them in the chat uh, and it'll be great to, uh, to get you on screen to ask him. Um, we've, as, as a business community, seen plenty of success stories in Oxfordshire uh, where apprentices have been brought into businesses and they've made the successful trans transition into full-time employment. And many of our members tell me that you know, graduate intakes have been reduced. They're focusing more on apprentices. For a number of reasons, you know, apprentices have less financial baggage, they maybe live locally, um, they're easier to mould into their sort of ideal uh, employee rather than being told by a graduate what they want to do and how they want to do it and how much they want to get paid, which is probably more than, than an apprentice. So should, your, should employees, in your opinion, value university degrees anymore? Well, it depends what they're teaching. There, there's no question that universities have a, uh, an essential um, role in terms of, you know, if you're teaching chemistry, you're going to have to go into the lab and do the odd test, right? So someone has to provide those facilities for you. Yep. And, uh, and they, they should be at a, a location. So in, 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 in location-based type services, the universities are, are important. There's no question that in, in advanced learning, where there's a small number of people working together, often it, it, it makes sense to get together. And in that uh, area, in that sense, again, it's good to be together. But there's an awful lot of areas where colleges 
just aren't competitive anymore. And uh, you know, you, as you said, I answered to some extent the, the question is that uh, with with degrees, it, it is it is more important what you know and what you prove you can do what you can do. So I I understand entirely why the apprenticeship scheme was reintroduced because let's give government a bit of credit here in the sense that they could see that this was happening and that they and there was there was feedback coming back from employers to say what we most of the learning that we need is actually going to be taught within the environment of, of, of business. So let's bring them in. They don't have to be spending four years of some of the best years of their life out there, not learning the right thing, not learning it fast enough, and it costing too much. Mm. So yeah, absolutely. If you look at it on a, on a country level, why would we put the youth of the, of the country in secondment for three to four years when actually they could be out driving industry uh, a, a lot better? instead of just coming out in four to five years time. So I, I think it's a, it's a very smart thing to do. Uh, and, and I guess one thing it leads on to and something that mightn't be seen is that uh, in industry over the last 20 to five, oh, well, maybe for decades has been dependent on, um, on uh, university courses reflecting uh, the, the margin of where industry is. But actually colleges are too slow at creating courses. If you go to do an engineering course, uh, at a college now, it may be outdated in four years' time. Whereas if you're learning on the job and you're in the company and you're doing the work that the company wants you to do, that information is very sharp. So what you're going to see, one thing that people don't see on, on, on Allison is that actually there's a whole publishing side of Allison where you can go on and create your own courses and you can create your own certification around that. So if a small business has a particular type of expertise that it needs its own employees to know and nobody else, then it can come on, create a course, get them to pass it, get them create the assessments and off they go. And that's entirely free. So, and they don't have to be going down to the local college and they don't need to be getting grants from the government. They can move much quicker. Excellent. No CPD? Uh, CPD is, um, we're used, Alison is used for CPD right across the world. Uh, whether we, you know, there is uh, an ad hoc uh, infrastructure for CPD, both in the UK and around the world. It's, uh, so uh, I, I like to think that you know, years ago, for instance, uh, when, when Alison had a very small number of people, uh, they'd say, you know, who are you to create a standard on project management? And, I, and my answer had to be, well, we feel it's a good course. Study it. If you, if you get bored with it, go away. It's not costing you anything. But if it's good, stick with it and learn, right? Uh, now we have a million uh, graduates of project <laughs> management, and we just say, well, well we've created our standard. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do, is to create universal standards. On, on anything that you can learn anywhere. You know. Fantastic, facts speak for themselves. So no chemistry courses, so no, no, you're not, not responsible for any sort of minor. No, we have chemistry courses, but you they're do. theory courses. <laughs> but we're not gonna show you to do how, how to do the, the practical. No, so you're not, you're not responsible for the minor explosions all around the world. Um, yeah. Mike, that's great, well thank you for, for answering my questions. We've got Nick Hughes, uh, dynamic coach. Nick, do you wanna join us and uh, put your question to Mike? There he is. Hi Nick, how are you? He's an Everton fan, Mike. I'm not sure that's going to influence your answer at all. So. Oh, I'm a diehard Red fan. But anyway, I, oh, there I you go. Match made in heaven. Brilliant. Yes. Uh, what, what can I say? Man United fan, obviously. Who'd want to be a Liverpool fan these days? Yeah. <laughs> Some, somebody else who supports Liverpool and doesn't live in the city. Hi, Mike. Thanks very much for this afternoon. And uh, Richard, thanks for hosting it. Um, I posed a question to the rest of the, uh, in the chat box, Mike. Is, um, uh, how do you see your model changing and what restrictions do you foresee it may have in the future? All right, so our model and how we make money today is advertising and certification. And because we're a socially focused business, we don't insist that you, that you buy a parchment to graduate from college. And that works well. So about one in 10 people actually buy it, but it's a significant source of revenue. So on the advertising side, um, what, what we're finding is we're applying AI to, uh, to, the, uh, to the platform all the time. We're providing more accurate advertising. Uh, so we've, we're finding in parts of the website that we can reduce the advertisement because we're making enough money. For us, scale is important. We're at 16 million learners now, and uh, you know we'd like to get to 100 million as soon as we can. So we're less interested in, in profitability and, more, and just break even would just work for us. So in charging towards that, uh, you know, one thing I like about advertising as a model is, is that there's equity to it. If somebody clicks an ad in, adver in California, uh, we might make four or five bucks. If one clicks it in Africa, we might make a cent. Uh, the fact is, California, the wealthy part of the world, is subsidizing free learning in another part of the world. 
So I, I, I like it for that. And advertising has, uh, you know, revolutionized uh, our working lives. Can we imagine uh, life without TV or Sky or you can't watch Sky on Everton on Sky or whatever if there's no advertising. So advertising, you know, people used to have a snobbery about, well, it can't be applied to uh, education. Well, sure it can. <laughs> and that's what we've done. But ideally, what we've been finding is actually, um, the, as our brand has become stronger, the number of people certifying and paying for certificates has been going up and up. And I, I, would, hope, I would hope that someday we'll actually be able to take advertising entirely off the website and it would be a cleaner learning environment. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I believe in the business model. I believe that all costs in education will be driven to, uh, to zero because at the end of the day, education is not like entertainment where you need to have something new every day. 99% of education, somebody else is learning the same thing somewhere else. Can mm -hmm. it be digitized? And if it can be digitized, the, <clears throat> the same unit can be shared with the entire world. You just have to change the language, the level and that. So. I, I see that education is a four trillion dollar business. I'd love to make it a five hundred billion business, and of course, a lot of lot, a lot of people would scream uh, at that idea. But look at the resources it could release to dealing with bigger problems, uh, and and we could reduce the size of the industry and provide a lot more value, like like music. You know, um, music was once a, you know had a much bigger turnover, and uh, today it doesn't turn over as much, or certainly outside of live music but a lot more people are listening to stuff and music is all around us. Thank you. It was a much fuller answer than, uh, than I thought you were going to give me, but yeah, it sounds really good. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Lucinda, Lucinda Whiteley from uh, um, Novel Entertainment. Novel Entertainment, sorry, I always get that wrong. Are you there, Lucinda? From sunny Oxford, how are you? Your mic's I'm on? I'm good. Oh, perfect. Hi, Lucinda. Hello. Hi, hi, Mike. Thank you so much. Really interesting. I have to apologize because I missed the very beginning due to my event bright not wanting to let me in. Um, I, but I don't think you would have covered my question necessarily at the start. I wanted to I'd just ask you about the digital deficit, which is kind of the um, umbrella term that I find myself using more and more in terms of the gap, not, not for families who find that they can't operate with learning and work and you know just sharing one iPad between them, but families who genuinely don't have access through internet and also through devices. So school kids who are trying to do their homework on a mobile phone, which may actually you know, they, they may have to be having to share with a parent as well. And I'm interested really um, in whether you're aware of any um, international or national agencies who are really focusing on this and who it's worth approaching really to try to support in that respect. Uh, the answer on do I see institutions responding to the need as we would probably like? No. I don't. Uh, has it been uh, as a result of the lack of our suggestions? No. Um, you know, one thing I, I, I've uh, felt is that we really need, uh, it needs to be a community uh, across all age levels because younger people, el uh, older people need to be involved. I, you know, I, I had an idea that I proposed to several governments and it was simply just a, a campaign called Be One in a Million. And it can be be one in a billion. Actually, I've been saying this to Facebook and Microsoft. We should have a campaign called Be One in a Billion, where essentially we create basic courses on on on, on digital uh, access to skills. So, so you know, I know it's, it's you're talking about a hardware and access to to some extent. That is a tough issue, but actually, most people have a mobile phone, even if they're hungry. <laughs> so th th we we can get to people, but can we get people literate enough? You see people going around with mobile phones, but uh, can they use it well? And can they, are they aware of the services uh, uh, that, that would really be useful <laughs> besides the Facebook and uh, you know, toxic information that they might be receiving? So uh, what I would love to see is, is a program like Be One in a Billion, where uh, we put out a, 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 a core course that's, that's short enough to actually do quite well, change it into every language and say, hey, we're really going to make an impact in this globally that we should have a billion people doing this course. And, you know, even if it took an hour, an hour and a half to do, so young and old could actually achieve it. What if the government turned around and said, okay, part of this, every, every member of the civil service is going to do that. What about every kid in school that we pay for to be there? What if the army said, hey, every, every staff member is going to do that? You know, we could get an awful lot of communities just standing up and saying, uh, looking to the person behind, beside us and, and who, who is 
reticent to get on board because they're a little bit wary of technology or whatever and saying, can, can we, you know, this is, it's, it's just like, I guess that's one thing that maybe COVID is bringing to us. As much as we might complain, there's no question that communities have worked together to, to try and, and deal with this. But we have other bigger issues and maybe you could be thinking COVID is, is a message from on high to try and prepare us for it. But how are we going to deal with climate change? And communities need to work better together. But I, I love the fact, and I, I'm still a disciple of this, that we, we can be using free learning platforms to educate people on things that they really need to know. You know, with COVID, I looked at the other day, we, we, we created our COVID course, our first COVID course we published on February 3rd. In it, we talked about 10,000 people being infected worldwide, right? Yeah, now we're, we're on the version 10 and it's been transferred into 56 languages. All of those 56 languages were transferred by volunteer labor. This is people, Allison learners all around the world and 600 of the medical professionals put up their hand and said, hey, we know that you have the distribution. We know you have the publishing capability. We have the expertise. We'll take the core stuff from the, the World Health Organization and, and the CDC in the US and put these courses together. So I guess it's a little bit removed from where you started in terms of digital deficit, but I think community effort and using the power of technology and using platforms like ours, and I'd like to say that it, platforms which are socially focused, that we're not like Facebook. We don't have to uh, turn around and make an investor return at a certain stage. We do have investors, but they're patient and they're impact focused. So they're more interested in that we're, we can change things. That's fascinating that you're talking about a centralized informational course in that way that um, because one of the big issues as you say moving slightly away but one of the big issues is information and how people are receiving their information on what's happening Absolutely. so i'm intrigued to know how your um your quality control works in that way but i think we, <laughs> we haven't got enough time necessarily for that. well we don't have, we don't have enough large platforms and i don't see us as that large we're 16 million you know 100 million is not that far away if we were 100 million we would be the biggest learning platform in the world and we will you know Coursera is at around 60 million we will catch up i believe but uh, there's a whole load that you can do. If you have 100 million, you could have, uh, you know, Alison Messenger. You could have Alison News. You can do all of these things. And uh, these are things that are sorely needed in the world because the current providers uh, just are not fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you, Lucinda. Good, Good to see you and your um, impressive satellite dish there. <laughs> yes, it looks like it, doesn't it? <laughs> I wish. Um, so finally, um, Scott, you've got a question for... Um, the mic and then we'll, we'll, we'll round things off with, with your question. You're on mute, Scott. There you go. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Hi, Scott. How are you? Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm just wondering um, what courses have been the most popular during lockdown? Have you seen any sort of trends? As obviously, you mentioned the COVID courses. Have you seen any others with a spike? Yeah, um, I guess core business courses have been very, very popular. Uh, I mentioned project management before. Um, also, just uh, I'm always a, a lot of people were drawn to. We noticed an interesting statistic, statistical in, environment in COVID, is that uh, people were studying much more intensely. Uh, their certification rates, their click-through rates, their, their, yeah, their certification rate. The number of people that completed courses was so much higher. The number of people who bought certificates was so much higher. There was tremendous determination. People said, you know, hey, th these are tougher times. I am going to upskill. And uh, what, I found, what we found was a lot of people who hadn't done basic stuff that they should have known years ago uh, came in and started doing it. So things like Microsoft Excel, you know, people had just about uh, some skill in Excel, but not, not really proficient. It always amazes me how many people have never done a touch typing course. <laughs> people type for a living. And, yeah. uh, you know, if five minutes doing a touch typing course can, can save months off your life. So... Uh, that type of courses and, and then what we see is in increasingly quest, uh, courses on digital marketing you know a lot of people turning to themselves unemployed and saying i'm going to create their own business online so digital marketing uh, a lot of people want to learn about ai uh, a lot of immigrant people uh, coming making sure that their english language skills which is so important not just in the uk and ireland but right across the world uh, we have 64 70 uh, 64 65 courses uh, free courses on english so they, they're the courses that were, I guess, strongest in those times. And, and then things like, uh, you know, people going off and doing a GDPR course, uh, things that are essential for their workplace. They say, you know, they all know that uh, 
digital literacy, things like data, com uh, data compliances are, are going to be ever more important in the workplace. So picking off courses like that. So, you know, just to have on your CV or resume that you've done a GDPR course. Th that's the type of thing that people yeah. were looking to do. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Scott. Mike, um, I'm conscious we've gone past time. We've got one more question. Uh, is that okay if, if you answer? Sure. That? Perfect, yeah. So we've got Frank um, from local law, law firm Fries. Frank, do you want to ask your question or would you like me to ask for you? Fries, brilliant. Good to see you, Frank. You're on mute. There you That's go. It. Perfect. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Technology. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Thank my Mike. question was about. Thank God, impact. Mike says. <laughs> yeah. My question was about the impact of artificial intelligence on skills that are really needed now to be successful, and I just wondered what you see as the most revolutionary changes at the present time that's going to impact upon the workforces that we employ. I, I, uh, so I, ha I have a standard answer to this, <laughs> in some ways. So you see automation, and what we really need to do is to automate learning. And, and I think that learning, particularly for companies, has to go much more internal. Within most companies, uh, the, the issue is uh, for most companies that are operating and working well, the, the intelligence that they need within the company is already there. The problem is sharing it and actually getting it transferred from one person to another. And that's always been difficult in times past. But actually, I think we're entering an era now where everyone's a learner and everyone's a teacher. So what you need to do is not only learn how to, how, to, how to learn online and do your assessments and pass them, how about learning saying, hey, at some level, I'm an expert within the business. I know a particular area of this business better than anyone else. Create a course on it. Make sure that there's transferability of knowledge. And what we do, I, I, I call it agile organizations. It's just organizations that slow down all the times because people move, they bring the knowledge with them. People retire, they bring it. People, you know... Uh, so uh, there's a lot of information and knowledge leakage in every organization around the world. How can you keep that strength within the business and how can you, uh, and how can you get the most from your employees? And I think it's, it's making the sharing of information uh, within the business uh, a lot more efficient and, and also creating your own certifications around it. So again, if a company is an expert in something, they should have, uh, they should have a certification around it. And also, they not only should be teaching people the skills within their business, but when you have a product, and if that product has any sort of a price point beyond a few dollars, or you know, say, well, let's say not just very low, but 50 to to $100, there should be courses about how to use that course or how to use that product and service. We've got, we've got to get a lot sharper to teaching people. We have brought, we've, we've, we're lending from the Victorian age too long. We, ha we, we have to start becoming our own teachers. And, uh, and, and sharing information and using technology to do that. So I guess that's my answer in, in the sense that uh, I feel we need to automate learning by not having just the output, which is the learning, but, but really revolutionize the input and, and provide an awful lot more information uh, that people can, can digest uh, and utilize. And I think that's happening very rapidly. And I think that that's going to catch a lot of people unawares <laughs> uh, because that's, you know, some companies who really do that well are going to be so much more competitive than, their, than, than other people in their industry. Great. I think the comfort in that is that human intelligence is always going to outpace artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a panicker of artificial intelligence. I think that you know, the, the work and the products and services that are created in the world today will perhaps be uh, created with 50% or 40% of the effort in times in, in the future. But by doing that, they create more leisure time for which we need more <laughs> humans to, to facilitate that market. I, I think there'll be more products and services that we've never thought of. And also it's a, it's a little like the music industry, which I was involved in 20 years ago when the internet came along. People within a week, you could see that uh, it's gonna be very hard to charge for music. But look at, if you've tried to go to Bruce Springsteen uh, to a concert, how much did you pay for the ticket? It's that live thing. It's just that preciousness of human interaction. And I think that's what's going to happen in society is that we're going to put a, put a lot more value on the, on, on the simple meeting of people. And uh, that started with, the Bruce, with Bruce Springsteen and, and, the, uh, and, and music uh, in the sense of going towards live, live performance and, and the value of being there. And, and, and it's going to impact travel as well. It's going to take a long time for travel to get back where it was. 
because of the uh, the, the climate cost and uh, yeah, and for so many other reasons. But yeah, I, I'm hopeful. I don't, I don't. I'm not one of the naysayers that think AI is 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 troublesome. Uh, oh, I won't say that. That's incorrect. It can be very troublesome in the wrong hands. We have to be very careful with it. But but there's. We, I think a lot of people are aware of the, the challenges that AI might pose in, in, in the future, and at least we see it coming. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Mike, you, it's interesting you touched on um, how people are, are, are coming around to, to wanting to teach, and we obviously had during lockdown a, a lot of reluctant parents having to teach. Have you seen any of those coming through doing courses in, in areas of their own expertise that they've got the, the taste of it, becoming a, being a teacher, albeit? for their children but um have they have they felt real joy in doing that um and, and coming onto your platform um i tell you what we do see is is that young people today are are, are educating themselves in in a far more efficient way than 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 school has allowed them a, a lot of kids will go on they'll watch videos they'll read what's of interest to them they'll follow their curiosities they'll follow their passions a lot more Whereas if you go to school, you're being told what you're going to learn and what you need to go home with in your head. Whereas I think that the younger people are a lot more creative. And, and that's one thing I, I've heard from parents uh, who have been uh, resigned to saying, oh, my God, I now have to, need to, have to teach my kids. You know, a lot of parents turned around and said, I don't really care exactly what my kids learn about. But if they're really interested in engineering and they want to know how a plane works and they go off and they watch a ton of videos on aeronautics, I don't have, you know, I don't have a problem. There is an enormous amount of free and uh, free education out there, and I think this prescriptive education that we've had in high schools and secondary schools across the world, it's it's probably the best solution that we've had. Uh, so let's not beat ourselves up about it. But with so much available, so much learning, and so much knowledge accessible on the web now, I think we have to start releasing the reins on younger people, and pe and younger people are becoming very innovative about what they learn from the ages of 13 and 14 and 15. So I think we have to reduce the panic levels of kids being at home at 15, 16, 17 and 18 and not going to school. Don't worry about them. <laughs> I won't say don't worry about them at all. It has, obviously, school is built into, uh, into our social fabric. Uh, if parents go, you know, who's gonna mind the kids or bring them from school and all that sort of stuff. All of that social stuff is important and it can't be dismissed. But generally speaking, for younger people that are, that are getting up in their teenage years, uh, we, I think that we can start releasing them in terms of teaching them stuff. What we need to do more is socializing them, make sure that they, they meet with people, that they, they, they go do things, that they understand what leadership is, they understand what responsibility is, they understand what empathy is. These are the things that we really need to teach our young people. But learning and teaching them facts and things, no, online is going to take that away from, uh, and, and also the government should be delighted because actually they won't have to pay for this in, in, in in, in decades ahead, uh, it's going to be a really different environment. Have you had some interesting sort of um, turnarounds in terms of organisations and individuals that have sort of been vehemently against, opposed to what you're doing, but have come round to seeing seeing the light in, in your um, vision? Well, I, I think there are state training agencies who really would rather we didn't exist and uh, know that they have large um, facilities around the country uh, with people working in those facilities who are trainers and uh, but actually they don't know what uh, the, you know uh, what needs to be taught is not what they know anymore and a lot of the training agencies are left with a situation where they have a lot of employees and the government says no you can't let go you know 8,000 people tomorrow <laughs> uh, they, they need to restructure and it's painful for them I guess in in so for governments, it's very hard to, uh, to change. I, I guess one of the big things is the, is the, you know, I mentioned earlier that education is a $4 trillion business. There's a whole load of status quo in this business. There's a whole load of university presidents who do not want to lo lose their half a million a year and will keep, try to keep things the same. And the people that change these things at the end of the day are the politicians, and it's hard to get to them when they're surrounded by these people. Often politicians will say, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to lead a new vision of, of higher education and who do they ring up? They ring up the, the local president of the university to say, what do you think? When it's exactly, these are the people that are dying. These are the people whose institutions are not fit for purpose anymore. So uh, politicians and policy makers need to be a bit braver. 
often the innovators in any market are not the people with the big marketing budgets and the PR to be able to get in front of you. They're the people that are quietly changing things and using resources in a different way. You've got to often go look for them because, you know, say for our organization, we're not set up for getting large government grants. It just takes too long. <laughs> we just rather go off and do it ourselves. Um, you know, in, 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 um, in, 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 in Ireland, for instance, we, we have over 200,000 people that are signed on to Alison. We had something like 50,000 people complete courses in, 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 in quarter two of this year with the COVID thing. We didn't get one cent of government uh, help. Uh, we had similar, uh, we, we actually have the high, highest, we have a very high density of learners in the UK. Uh, about, um, we calculated one in 15 members of the UK workforce uh, have been on the Allison website. So we have a lot of penetration there. But uh, we, we don't deal with the government in the UK. Uh, they ask our opinion at a policy level, and then when they go to implement, they're nowhere to be seen with a checkbook. <laughs> so, uh, look, I, I don't want to sound in any ways bitter. I'm not at all. I, I know where they're coming from. Innovation is hard. Innovation comes up through the floorboards. It never comes in the front door, you know, <laughs> in terms of floods. Uh, it's, uh, so it's hard to deal with, and it's hard for incumbents. I understand that. Yeah. But... Uh, we really need to, for the betterment of society, we need to up, up, uh, you know, adopt these new, these new ways of doing things. Brilliant, Mike. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm, we have one last question from Geeta. Geeta, if you don't mind me asking, Mike, if it's just a very short answer, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty. Are you referenced sort of um, giving uh, the next generation sort of softer skills, um, training, communication skills, etc. cetera? Um, courses on soft skills, e.g. social skills, I presume that there are plenty on, on the site. There, there are. Uh, there's no question that hard, harder skills, which are uh, programmatic or law or something that's very factual, they're, they're easier to teach. So, uh, but I do think that there are some people that would say that, uh, you know, online learning can, uh, cannot, uh, cannot teach soft skills. But that's not true because there's innovation going on all the time. Uh, people are using video all the time. A lot of people are just creating courses with their mobile phone. They can edit them. They can create assessments. They can do it all on their phone. They can create a course sitting on a bus. So there is, there is just a new environment of, of how we learn and how we create teaching products. So uh, anything is going to be teachable online uh, very soon. Brilliant, Mike. Really appreciate it. And uh, good luck with your quest to hit 100 million. When, when, are, you, when are you aiming for to, to achieve that by? Oh, uh, I, you know, I, I had said months. that uh, I'd said in the past that I would like to do it by 2020. Uh, I don't think we're going to do it by the end of the year, but don't count us out soon you've enough. Got, you, you've got a good excuse to put the brakes on for, for a few months. but uh... Well, you know, when, when we started off and we had, you know, you get your first learner and then you get 10,000. When you're 10,000, you want a 50,000, you want a 100,000. When you get to 16 million, 100 million ain't so far. Okay. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, um, I, I wish I shared some of your ambitions. Uh, hopefully um, you certainly inspired me to uh, a bit, bit of you has rubbed off on me and I'm sure on everybody else that's joined us. It's been a pleasure to have you for the first of our B, B4 Inspiration webinars. Um, and I look forward to catching up soon and, and when you've hit that milestone. All right. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate the time. Take care. Take care. Thank Bye you. Now. Thanks everybody for joining us.